Today's guest is the co-owner of Epic Leisure Management LLC and the owner of Parker Personal Training LLC. He's a featured writer and presenter for national fitness organizations. He's also the host and creator of Dr. D's Social Network, a podcast devoted to genuine, open, and honest conversations with people from all over the world. Welcome to the show, Dr. Parker. How are you doing? I'm good. And yourself? How's it going today? I'm doing very good. Thank you so, so much. As I said before we started recording, I'm excited to be speaking with you um, about fitness, about, you know, personal training and about um, wellness. So I'm, I'm doing really good. Thank you so, so much for, for joining me today on this episode of Mirror Talk. Um, be, before, we, before we jump into a conversation, can you please just share a bit about your life journey so far? Um, what motivated you to, you know, earn your PhD in sports education leadership with an emphasis in um, behavior modification? Yeah, my life journey, I think, um, for me, I really enjoyed being in athletics growing up. I mm -hmm. think a lot of people have a similar feeling about playing sports and stuff. And, and uh, I just really wanted to keep it going. I was a collegiate track and field athlete, and I enjoyed doing that. And while I was earning my bachelor's degree in kinesiology, I felt like they went together. I was studying about the human body and I was also training really hard on a regular basis every day. And so I could learn something and then apply it or feel it in my body. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, you know, this is what I want to do with my life professionally. I want to do something within exercise or uh, physical activity. And so I, but I also felt like I wasn't ready to work. I like when I graduated my bachelor's degree, I'm like, I'm not ready to work yet. I want to continue to get education. So I got my master's degree also from James Madison University in kinesiology, did some coaching with track and field. And I really liked that too, but I would just decide, you know, uh, I really, I don't want to work 80 hours a week. Yeah. I don't want to like spend my life constantly working over and over again. So I was figuring like, what's this thing I want to do? Like, I don't want to work crazy amount of hours but I don't want to work too little either. I want to be able to like really enjoy my job, but also have time to do other things in my life. Cause I didn't want to be defined as being like a fitness person. Mm. I was like, I want to be someone who is into a variety of things yeah. and fitness happens to be my profession, but it doesn't define who I am as a person. Yeah. So I had all the hard science and I said, you know, I want to get my doctorate just to like really top it off. And so I went to University of Nevada, Las Vegas, mm. and got my doctorate in sports education leadership with an emphasis in behavior modification, because I wanted to learn about people. I wanted to learn how other people think, mm. how their behaviors influence their life, mm. and how I could be an intervention in their life for desirable uh, outcomes for that. So that was basically my educational journey, which took you know, from bachelor's all the way through my doctorate, about 10 years or so. Yeah. Uh, and I finished when I was 29. So I was, uh, you know, pretty early. Um, but it gave me a lot of confidence to go into the professional workforce with a lot of education, you know, some experience, and really kind of know more know who I was as a person too. Awesome. Yeah, that, that's, that's really awesome. You know, earlier you said, um, you know, you spent a lot of time, you know, studying the human body and also how other people, you know, take all of these things. So um, from your studies so far, from your education, can you like tell me something about the human body? Tell me how other people understand this topic from your study, from your PhD, for example, or from your master or bachelor? Yeah, I think, you know, it's funny. I think the educational aspect of it is, it sounds bad, but like a very small percentage of what you actually do in the business. <laughs> I feel like it'd be an education doesn't prepare you for actually doing the job mm. of whatever it is in fitness, whether it's a personal trainer, whether you're running a gym, a wellness coach, whatever it is. I feel like the formal education really doesn't teach you about being there with somebody. Mm. Like that's just experience. You need yeah. to gain the experience. Hopefully you're at a school that they give you a lot of that, but there isn't a lot of that in a lot of schools. It's mainly about learning about the hardcore aspects of the science, the mm -hmm. origin insertion of muscles, the acute and chronic adaptations. All this is good, but rarely ever used with clients, like almost never. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's mm-hmm. which is why I wanted to get my doctorate in more of a psychology based degree because I knew I would use that every day. Mm. I could use that in my personal life and my professional life. And so I think the education of probably the best education I had was uh, two classes that had nothing to do with my, well, they have, they have to do with my profession, but they weren't billed as being that way. Mm. I took a basic counseling course, uh, which I thought was really good because I wanted to learn what it was like to have therapy and to understand myself yeah. better yeah. so that I could understand other people better. And I think that's a big mistake people make is they don't learn about themselves first and mm. kind of master the creature within and really sit down and like, who am I as a human? Yeah. And what hangups do I have as a person? What are my blind spots? What are the problems I have? Mm. How do I address this? And then go and start helping other people. I think a lot of people, they just help people and they're a mess. You know, kind of a thing. Yeah. You know? Yes. and yes. I didn't want that. I wanted to take care of this mess first mm. and then, you know, and keep growing, obviously, but have a know who I am. Yes. And the second class is I took uh, public speaking because I was terrified of speaking in front of people. Mm. And I did that for a semester and had to do a speech every single week in front of a lot of people. And it gave me wow. the confidence to be a good facilitator of communication. Mm. So those two things I felt like helped me the most. Yes. And today, till to this day, I think they're probably the most important classes that I had because it helped me become a performer mm. and an artist in my um, profession. So I think those two things, probably the things I would carry most or give advice to people about. Well, I really love what you said about, you know, sometimes we, we are a mess ourselves, right? But we still go ahead to help other people with their own kind of, you know, issues and problems while, you know, what is affecting us is killing us within so, like kind of, and I like the fact yeah. that you, you actually, you know, took the step to go to school, take some courses, you know, to work on the weaknesses that you had. And now you're, you're, you're better off for it. That, that's really nice. Yeah. That's yeah. Really cool. I just, I just felt like there was, th- there was something inside of me that I wanted to get out. Mm. And I was a very shy person in high school. Mm. And I felt like I could be this more gregarious, bigger person, like this more fun person. I just had to figure out how to let that out. Mm. And I think those two courses, along with a bunch of mentors and people, that it helped me become the person I am today. And, and I keep continue to learn mm. and uh, continue to grow and learn about myself. But I think before I really wanted to get into working, mm-hmm. I really felt like I needed to have the time to mature. Mm. And I really feel like that's the opposite of today. It's like, I think a lot of young people just want to start working, making money. They want to start up, do everybody wants to do a startup mm. and have this big company and yet they have no life experience. They haven't worked on themselves. Mm. And I think it's, it's okay to like defer making money. Mm. You know, obviously you got to take care of yourself and you have to survive, but, you know, spend the time to really know you. If I asked you, who are you as a person? Mm-hmm. A lot of people cannot answer that question because they've yeah. never actually gone through their inner space and tried to figure out who they actually are. Mm. That's true. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. So please, can you, can you tell me about um, Epic Leisure Management LLC and Parker Personal mm-hmm. Training LLC and what are the services that they offer? Yeah. Uh, so Epic Leisure Management started a little over three years ago with a business partner of mine. Mm-hmm. And our, our company is one that's kind of a one-stop shop. So we do everything from concept design, business planning, all the way up to turnkey management of luxury health and wellness amenities. So like spas, um, recreational um, fitness facilities, private Mm. fitness facilities and residential neighborhoods, hotels, that whole deal. So we do everything from the idea of the amenity all the way to through running it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Parker Personal Training, Uh, I've been training for almost 20 years. And so it's really just offering personal training services um, mm-hmm. but I look at it more of as like, it's companionship. Now, mm-hmm. let me explain that in a sense that I really think that training is companionship mm-hmm. and compassion mm-hmm. and creating meaning and lasting relationships with other people. And then exercise is also part of it. Oh, okay. Whereas the other people put it the other way. It's like exercise is the main thing. Mm-hmm. And maybe you'll gain a friendship during that and you'll have 
you know, you work with some people here and there. For me, I really focus on the psychology of working with people. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the exercise is important, but you will not keep people because of exercise as a trainer. You just won't. There's a lot of people that offer exercise. There's very few people that offer companionship mm -hmm. and connectivity, like meaningful connectivity. Mm -hmm. And in the end, personal training is a performance. It's yeah. art. I really believe that. I believe it's first and foremost, it's, it's how you make people feel about themselves, mm -hmm. not necessarily how you conducting the exercise aspect is important, yeah. very important, but how you make people feel about themselves is even more important. So mm -hmm. I really, you know, focus on that with my personal training business. Yes. And this companionship you're talking of is about, um, you know, companionship between the, the personal trainer and the um trainee or the person that's been you know yeah, the client yeah. the client exactly okay so is, is there like some kind of um companionship program between the clients within themselves like you know people that go to the gym for example or people that in your program your fitness program is there like some kind of um, companionship program for them or it's just always within in between the um, personal trainer and the client I mean, that's a good question. It's usually just between me and them, but mm -hmm. a few of them know each other and connect with each other. Yeah. Um, I really think that a lot of people go into training thinking about it being for exercise and mm -hmm. often like a person's main goal is losing weight, yeah. which um, I never think is a good goal for mm -hmm. people to have because uh, I don't think that's actually what they want. I think they actually want... I don't think they know what they want, actually. I think they see that they want to be in better condition or they yeah. see someone else or they see something on TV, mm -hmm. and but they don't understand the actual effort it takes to get to a certain level of fitness. Mm -hmm. But I also think people, if they're honest with themselves, they want, they want companionship. They want somebody to talk to. Yeah. They want somebody to, to be able to tell all their things to about their life, mm -hmm. and uh, which is okay. But I, I just rather people be honest about like, hey, I want to exercise, but I also want a friend. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's okay if that's what you want yeah you know yes, it's like yes. but to tell you it's about exercise like okay maybe it is purely mm -hmm. but maybe it's also about to mend your mental health you just want somebody to talk about the the day you've had you yeah. want somebody to come home to and talk about your day okay i'll be that for you too mm -hmm. you know like so i i really think it's um the companionship part i think is much bigger than uh than people are talking about Mm -hmm. And I think it's mainly, it's the main thing about yeah. training. I really do believe that. Yeah. And, and how, how does, you know, accountability come into play, you know, between this, you know, tr and personal trainer and the client, um, this relationship, how does um, accountability come into this role that you play? Yeah. Yeah. Accountability is big. My big motto is love and accountability. I, I try to assert that in every phase of my life, whether it's with my wife, with my daughter, my professional career, mm. friendships. I think you, you can't have one without the other. You can have a lot of love and no accountability. Yeah. Then you're just basically telling people they're amazing all the time and then not having them be accountable when it doesn't go well. Mm -hmm. Or you can just have people like be strict with them, have them be accountable to things yeah. and never tell them anything good. And that's terrible too. <laughs> True. So you have to have both love and accountability mm. when you're working with people. And so I think that's, that's like a huge part of it. So for me, um, the accountability is like, Hey, we have a set time that we're training each week. I'm going to be connecting with you to make sure that I'm making the emotional investment yeah. in there. And over time you're teaching the behavior that you want. That's, that's part of my education is like, okay, what's a desirable outcome here mm. that they feel better, mm. that they, uh, more confident, mm. they're more loving to other people. And then they are in better condition. And yeah. I always put the, the, the fitness part last for me. Mm -hmm. They're in better condition. Because I think that comes if you're consistent and you do all the other things, you'll, you'll start feeling that other aspect of it too. But if you don't have accountability, I think it really uh, is difficult because I think most humans need a personal trainer. I really do. I mean, I think most, <laughs> there's very few humans that are extremely diligent and dedicated to work on their body. Mm -hmm. in a consistent way or in a smart way that will provide them with the results that are native to them, mm. actually. Because I think fitness is something people just do um, 
without any knowledge. I mean, how many, you go into a gym, there's so many people in there doing stuff. They have no clue what they're doing. Mm -hmm. None. True. But you would never just start like driving your car by yourself no. without knowing, you know, there's rules, there's standards. True. Of course. You know? yeah, yeah. But, but exercise, because it's your body, you think you're the, you're the expert on your own body, which is completely not true. <laughs> completely not true. Yeah. Most people have no clue about that. Mm, that's true. I was, I was going to ask you, like, for example, for people who do home workouts, for example, yeah. or who do like workouts um, by the side, um, how can they stay accountable to themselves? Like, how can we, you know, take that, you know, role from the personal trainer and apply it to ourselves and be accountable for our own fitness within our four walls? I think, I think one first one is get good information about, mm. um, about the, the hardcore aspect of the human body. I think a lot of people it's trial and error, which cannot be bad. It's not so bad if you're working on your body, you know, and if you're smart about it, you can, you know, that's how a lot of the beginning of fitness was people just like lifting things and go, oh, something changed, you know, and this and that. <laughs> but there's so much information that is good information from reputable sources about what is chronic adaptation, acute adaptation, understanding how muscular contraction actually works, different training programs, again, from reputable people. And the, as far as the accountability part, it really starts with different things like making, you know, making it a big part of your day, like, hey, I'm setting a time for this. And then I'm going to do little things to keep me accountable could be like, um, you know, having like your ex wearing your exercise clothing during the day. All right, you're already dressed for it, you're already yes. doing it, yeah. you know, making sure you have appropriate transportation to get mm -hmm. there. Or if you're at home, all right, you've taken the transportation thing out, setting boundaries around your personal life. Hey, I'm at home. If I'm with other people, let them know this is my time. I don't want to be interrupted during my exercise time unless mm -hmm. it's an emergency. You have to tell people these things or else they just go, oh, you're out there. I'll go talk to you mm -hmm. type of thing. Yes. So I think setting boundaries is probably the biggest thing mm -hmm. if you're at home setting those boundaries is going to be really big for you, whether that's boundaries with people in your life, boundaries with time, like without your phone, whatever it may be, you have to create an environment that's conducive for you to have regular exercise participation. Yes, yes. Now, I would love to combine, you know, um, your online um, personal training program, for mm -hmm. example. So what was the, what's the benefit of having online personal training? Like when, when I cannot be there physically with my trainer, um, yeah. what, what benefit do I get from, from just watching you on Zoom or watching you yeah. on your online platform? Yeah. Well, it's funny. So I do this the majority of my day training oh. clients just yeah. like this real time. And I started about four years ago because I thought that this was coming. I really did. I, I keep up with trends and I said, this is like technology and fitness are are, are rising together at the mm. same time in some weird space time thing. It's like happening. Mm. I want to be a part of it early. Mm. And as the technology keeps getting better, it's making this better for doing it. So I actually think it has, the benefits are many. One, I believe for the trainer, it creates huge lifestyle disruption in a positive way. Um, you're able to cut out the drive time or transportation time to places. Yeah. Uh, so that alone, let's say you're training somebody for an hour. If you do that, I don't do that. I normally do half an hour with people, but let's say you're doing an hour. You have to travel, let's say 15, 20 minutes, maybe a half an hour to somebody's place, train them for an hour and then drive back or to your next session. All right. So there's like a two hour window where you did one thing for work. Whereas if you're doing it a live virtual session, you could stack session after session, go from one call to the next. So in that two hour window, you worked one time, I worked three or four times during yes. that. Yes. So I'm going to make more money. I'm more efficient with my time. Mm -hmm. I can train less people and make more money doing that True. way. For True. the consumer, it also takes away their drive time. If they're going to a gym, takes away their uh, daycare services, generally speaking, for if they have children mm -hmm. for that. Uh, and it, and everybody has the technology generally that you're using. Mm -hmm. So everybody has a phone or generally a computer. Most people have that. So it's not like you're asking them to do something they're not familiar with yeah. already. That's a lot true. of times people go to gyms, they're unfamiliar mm -hmm. with the environment. Where does this go? Mm -hmm. Where should I meet? What's this machine? Uh, blah. And you're getting 
a more intimate experience. It sounds strange to say that, but actually training like this is more intimate than being in person with someone. And what I mean is that when you train people in person, which I still do a little bit of it, yeah. um, there's there's a lot of other noise. So whatever environment you're in, there's maybe noise, mm -hmm. actual physical noise. There are other visual sensations people are seeing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of distraction. Yeah. When yeah. we do this, like if we're doing this podcast, if all of a sudden I just got up and started looking around, so you'd be like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, you know, we're in a tunnel with each other right now. The only thing that we're seeing is each other. There's no looking away. There's no, well, maybe let me go here and do that. It's more intimate because you have to have to be more intimate and you have yeah. no choice. You're right in front of each other yes. type of thing. Yes. So it, there's a lot of uh, intimacy. There's a lot of efficiency. Um, and I think for the trainer's part point of view, if it's done well, it's actually will free up a lot more time in your life mm -hmm. for that. And the same thing for the consumer, you'll free up way more time to do other things you want to do. True. Wow. That's, that's awesome. So like, for example, if I want to enroll for your online personal training, for example, um, do I have to now buy all of the equipment from, uh, from my home um, gym or how does that work? You know, sometimes, you know, when you have like some um, gym membership, you just have to mm -hmm. go to the, to the gym and use the equipment in the gym. But with online personal training, I have to then buy all the equipment from my home gym and then, you know, work out from home while listening to you yeah. or interacting with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that's a good question. And our clients always ask that. Mm. And I say, well, listen, I think that when you're, I said, well, let me put it this way. When you're at the gym, what did you do when you were there? And they'll say, well, I ran on the treadmill or I lifted some weights. I'm like, so you really didn't do much there when you were there. You used a mechanized machine mm -hmm. and you lifted probably the same weights every single time. Yeah. Generally, you were doing, you were, you actually weren't using much of the gym mm -hmm. that was there, you know? So my approach always is too, is like, we will use some equipment, but things that are like more mobile, like, you know, dumbbells, kettlebells, resistance bands, mini bands. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of the equipment is very cheap. You can get on Amazon. It costs almost nothing. Very, very cheap. Mm -hmm. um, but I also tell them, in the beginning, we're going to be using you. <laughs> okay. I mean, the body do you know how to use you? You're like, you know, I, no matter how experienced you are, I will always pull them back to themselves first. Mm -hmm. I don't care how much weight they've lifted or I said, no, I guarantee you have not focused on mobility and stability building your hip and shoulder complex up the stability and mobility of those areas, dynamic movements. We need to build the house, the foundation before we start jumping into the other stuff. Mm -hmm. So initially we'll just use their body initially mm -hmm. and teach them how to move it in a way that's efficient before we start adding on external resistance, things that are more complex mm -hmm. when we're moving a weight through the air you know, whether it's, you know, using physics, biomechanics, all this stuff to change the intensity. And usually they're not used to that. They have no clue what that means. And I said, so I'll send them a link to the equipment that I want them to get, which is not a lot. And then a good trainer doesn't need a ton of equipment. A good trainer needs to know physics, biomechanics, motor learning. If you know that, you know how to change the stress of any activity and the variation to make it feel like the weight is heavier or harder to move for that. Wow. That's yeah. the science behind it. Mm -hmm. And then you add in the performance, the interpersonal communication, you get this amazing kind of art and science that come together with it. Mm. Wow. And that would be able to achieve their goal, their um, fitness goals. Then. Mm. But clients don't really know what their goals are. They tell <laughs> they think they know what their goals are. Yeah. How would you, how would they know? Like, they're like, well, I want to look like this. How do you even know what that looks like? Like, mm. I want to weigh this much. Okay. I mean, is that actually good for you? Mm. I mean, like, <laughs> I don't think they, I don't think most clients actually know what they want. I think they think they know what they want. And then through the course of training, mm. they end up seeing what the actual reality is. Yes. Yes. So how can we now set, you know, and realistic and um, achievable goals for ourselves, like um, wellness and fitness goals for ourselves? Uh, I th I'm probably a very counter to this whole thing. Like when I don't really ask people what their goals are for it. Uh, okay. I know it sounds strange, but like yeah. when I work with them, I said, listen, 
this is a living, breathing journey. So mm -hmm. if somebody tells you you're going to lose 20 pounds in the next month, two months, three months there, I don't, how do they know that? Like mm -hmm. they don't control your diet. They don't control your sleep. They don't control the stress levels in your life. I mean, there's so many variables. So I said, let's not focus on the goals. Let's just focus on starting mm -hmm. and being consistent. Your goal is to be consistent without being consistent. Who cares about the goals for that? Show up every time as mm -hmm. much as possible for that. I more create like accountability with mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. besides the love. So I'll say, Hey, if somebody says, I want to work out once a week, I'm like, that's why like mm -hmm. that. Okay. What happens when you cancel? So then there's two weeks gone. That's mm -hmm. a bad strategy. You should, you should plan at least two or three sessions. So if you cancel one, you have two left or yes. cancel do four. If you cancel mm -hmm. one, you have three. I'm not saying we will use every session, but at least you're putting it on the calendar. Yeah, yeah. So that you, I just want people to show up. That's like yeah. the main thing you show up, you give the effort, the goals will start happening. It will start coming together. Yes. It's different if they're like, Hey, I want to run a marathon or I want to do this. Okay. There's that's different training. And we're going to focus on some periodized training based off of the timeline of that. Mm -hmm. But most people don't have that. They just want to get in better condition. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> I don't know what that means. What I don't know what you're going to look like, what you're, how you're going to, what condition you're going to, and you don't know either. Yeah. So we're just going to go, we're going to, we're going to see how you react. My main goal is thing I tell people is stimulus. I say, um, recovery, stimulus yeah. response, recovery, SRR. So what's the stimulus we're providing? What's the response to that stimulus yeah. and how do you recover yeah. from the stimulus? That's it. And we're going to see how that happens week to week. And then we're going to continue to meld the program based off of that. So all of this um, depends on one's body, right? Like the way you respond yeah. to it and the way you recover from the workout from the stimulus depends yeah. on your body, your body structure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't depend on anybody else's body, only your body. Yeah. Mm. So how can we better understand our, our body to be able to, you know, determine what kind of workouts is the best for us yeah. or to be able to know what kind of, you know, um, exercises will be much more effective for us? Uh, I think like if you're, if you're not working with a good professional you're just working on your own, mm -hmm. um, really the test is you're going to have to test your limit. I really believe that mm -hmm. like to know, like how well you recover mm -hmm. from, let's say you're just doing your own workouts. You need to do a variety of workouts, do something very low intensity, do something moderate intensity and do something that's really strenuous mm -hmm. and chart how well you recover from that mm -hmm. chart, which days you feel better. What did you eat during this day? When you, when you did that, how much sleep did you get? You're mm -hmm. basically performing an experiment on yourself of saying, how do I, how can I get the most out of my body mm -hmm. by, by doing these different things? Let me experiment. Let me work out in the evening. Let me try the morning time. When do I feel best for that? I think you can't just be like, well, I'm a morning exerciser and never try evening. How do you know? You need to like find your limit and then work through that and find your lower level limit. And then you need to be able to say, okay, I like to work out on these days because this gives me the proper amount of rest so that I can have the best performance I can have. I think the other thing too is that people do exercise as kind of like this like begrudgingly, they do it. They just check it off. Oh, I worked out today. <laughs> and it's not about performance. I think mm. if you also can look at your exercises, it's performance. Yeah. I want to, I want to do well. I don't, ju I don't just want to show up mm -hmm. and mark, check the box and go, Oh, well, I did that today. Mm. Right. Look at it as I want to improve. You're going eat to the gym or outside or wherever you are to improve yes. in order to improve. It has to get harder over time. Yes. You have to have overload for that. Yes. Muscles don't get big by not doing anything mm -hmm. or not changing it up. You don't get, you don't run faster, jump higher, run farther by doing the same thing and checking the box. There has to be discomfort yeah. as part of it. 
Yes. Wow. I think so far you've already mentioned some mistakes that we make already, but I did like some, <laughs> I did like some other, you know, some, some other common mistakes that we make, you know, regarding fitness and wellness and how can we avoid these mistakes? I think you've covered some already, but I did some more. <laughs> yeah. I, I just think the main thing is seek the advice of people who have been doing it for a long time. Hmm. And I think most people in the business are happy to just chat with you and just, give you some information. They're not always going to be like, Oh, work with me. It's not that I think people who are like myself or anybody who just likes talking to people. Yeah. They just give you some pointers and tell you like, well, try this, do this, do that. I think um, it's really the mistakes, not always mistakes. So it's just trial and error too, you know, yeah. okay. but you just have to learn from those and, yeah. and don't be stubborn about what you are supposed to do. Yeah. Sometimes there's seasons where, you're going to do different things. Mm -hmm. You know, the other thing I think is really important is, uh, is having variety, but the variety making sense for that, not just like doing random stuff just to do it mm -hmm. you know, because it looks cool or something like that. Mm -hmm. What's the purpose of this? It, sometimes it drives me crazy. Like I'll be in the gym and I'll see somebody and they're like sprinting on a treadmill and then they start doing squats right after that. And then they go do something like this makes no sense mm -hmm. at all. Hmm. They're like, find out what makes sense. And I always tell people a simple way to do it is keep your cardio to just that do cardio for that day. Don't mix in weight training with it. Do your weight training a different day. Make it, a, you know, do your metabolic training this day. Don't try to like do everything, throw the kitchen sink in all at the same time hmm. to try to get all this stuff in. Be purposeful about your workout. Today, hmm. I'm going to work on cardiovascular endurance. Today, I'm going to work on more better metabolic training. Today is mobility and stability. Break it up into things that specific things you're working on for that day versus just doing a bunch of random stuff, you know? Yes. So would you say that there's something like a mentorship when it comes to, you know, in fitness sector, like apart from having a personal trainer, for example, can I also have like a mentor, like maybe I'm having you, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Parker as my personal trainer, I could have maybe a friend of mine also as a mentor who, because he's, you know, and, and he's an expert already or he has been working yeah. out for a long time. Is, is, that, is, that, is that a good mixture or is that a possibility? Potentially. I mean, I think it p depends on your friend's personality. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like, are they, you know, are there's someone who is very open-minded, uh, they conscientious, they're, um, they're kind of agreeable to different things, but they mm. keep you accountable. Or is it someone like, that is working with you, maybe a friend that knows a lot and they're just like, listen, I'm very close-minded to all these different other types of approaches. Mm -hmm. This is what you're gonna do, do that. Uh, you don't want that friend I know. for that, mm -hmm. you know? So it depends like, where are they on these different traits? Mm -hmm. Are they, you know, do you have a friend who's like emotionally unstable, mm -hmm. super neurotic? Okay, that's not a good mentor. <laughs> like, you know, want somebody who's emotionally stable, um, is open to the idea that there are different training methods that can be used throughout the year, different things. Uh, I, and I think it's, it's less about, I mean, it's about what the person knows, but it's mainly, I think about how that person is, uh, in terms of their personality yeah. and do you mesh well with them? No. Yes. Yes. Wow. So, um, not only for fitness or for wellness or for the health sector, um, can you like give me some skills or ways to develop consistency um, in whatever we do? Like we can use fitness for an, as a, as a mm -hmm. sorry, we can use fitness as an example, but I want to use it as for, for every other area of my life. How can I develop um, this skill set for consistency? Yeah, I think it's, it's much like I'll take a podcasting as a good example of it, you know, so you know, I host my own podcast and I've done like 350, close to 350 episodes. Yes. And uh, people always ask me like, that's so much, that's so many episodes. How do you keep doing that and stuff? I said, well, I think one, you have to be organized. Mm -hmm. I don't think in any aspect of your life, you're not going to be very good if you're not organized mm -hmm. and you don't have good systems in place. I think systems equal consistency. Mm -hmm. Do you have a good system in place? In the form of podcasting, you have a good booking system. Do you have a good follow-up system? What's the system for sharing, you know, the um, episodes and things? The fitness is, this, is the same way for that. What's the system? What's the accountability? So I think in all phases of your life, 
it's really, really about what are the systems you have in place to create consistency yeah. for that. And mm-hmm. so like, you can't just like hope another episode will happen for your <laughs> podcast. I'm like, well, I hope I have an episode next week. Yeah. Okay, no. What is your, what are your main sources or publicists you're using or whatever to, you need to have multiple uh, streams of people that are feeding you clients or multiple sites that you go to find clients and things mm-hmm. like that. Yes. And if you have a good mixture of that, you'll never have to worry about finding guests. Mm-hmm. They're just, you'll, you'll be able to find some and get some yes. type of thing. And mm-hmm. so you can take that same system um, with your life. Like people, sometimes people are like, well, I don't have many friends. I don't make friends. I'm like, well, what have you done to, to make more friends? I'm like, have you tried booking like a call every week with somebody or have you tried to go on sites and just ask people to chat with you just to connect and like no I haven't done that how can you expect to have friendship I'm like Mm -hmm. you're like you have to actually create systems and you do the action and the work for that so I'm a big systems person you know like if I have something to do I always have like a timer or an alarm clock that reminds me you know um like what do you use like for me email is what I, I write myself an email note I know I'm going to check that a lot. It'll keep mm. me staying on track. I have a calendar. I know when it's on a calendar, I have an invite, a reminder. I know a lot of people don't do that stuff. Mm. Like mm. they just like go, well, I think I have something next week. <laughs> How do you do that in life and still actually be successful? I don't mm. know. Mm. That's true. I, I love that. I love the fact that you make mention of that, like having a, a very solid system in place. Like yeah. I, I learned that also of recent also why starting this podcast journey also myself, like I learned the importance of, you know, having a calendar, the importance of scheduling everything, the importance yes. of having my, you know, my, my day programmed up so I can know when I have free time and when I don't have free time and when I can put what into what time slot of my day. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. Actually, I think if you're a podcaster and you're doing it well, it should teach you a lot about time management. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and post-production and mm. editing and the whole thing mm. and reaching out to guests and booking. I actually think it's good life skill being a podcaster because it, it if you want to do it well, it forces you to be a very organized person. Yeah. You're, you're right. You're very right. Yes. So you, you've worked extensively in both the academic and private club sector. Mm-hmm as a director of education for a career college. Um, how can we you know, combine these health and fitness courses or programs into you know, our academic sector? How, how, can they, how, how can we integrate a better structured fitness course or program? Like maybe um, some personal training programs into our schools or into our university courses so that our children or young ones can also yeah. you know, grow up with this mindset of being fit or LD, or you know, having this wellness mindset, even while in school, or why, why very, sorry, why very young? Yeah, I, man, this is a big question because <laughs> I know like that we're de-emphasizing health and wellness too much in schools. You know, it's so much about science, you know, STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, mm. and those things are important. But I don't know, man, you have your body, your body's the most, one of the most important things. Like if you don't know how to deal with your own body, who cares about science and technology and education and and engineering? It's like your health is extremely important. So actually when I was at a career college, I I really thought that was probably the best avenue for learning about at least becoming a trainer. Mm -hmm. The other aspects about in school, just about learning about your body, I think you just need better curriculum. Mm-hmm. about health and wellness. Um, but I really think it needs to be an experiential aspect. Like I, I think it'd be awesome. Like if in schools that, you know, kids had personal trainers in school, I mm-hmm. don't know how this would work, how <laughs> the payment system, but if you had, you know, like group exercise instructors and, in, in high schools and, uh, uh, junior high schools, they would at least be exposed to what it's like, you know, it's like, Nobody comes to like career day and is like, oh, I want to be a personal trainer. And it's like, they are always bring in like a firefighter or something, <laughs> or like a doctor. And they don't bring in like somebody like me. You know, it's like, I just think we need more exposure to mm-hmm. it as we're younger. Because the problem is, is that you're banking on your parents exposing you mm-hmm. to fitness and wellness or your friends. Mm-hmm. And I mean, based off of the world we live in, that's not a good deal. Because 
almost 70% of the United States population is overweight and obese. Mm -hmm. So very few parents could actually teach their kids about their health and wellness because they're not healthy or well. Mm -hmm. So I think it needs to, we need to have more exposure early on from professionals saying, hey, this is an important aspect of life, your body, and also how to deal with the emotional and social aspects of living in your body for that. Yeah. That's given zero attention, zero for most places when you grow up. You know, you learn about fitness, just, you know, lifting weights with your friends or playing sports. It just kind of mm. happens mm. informally. Mm. But I'd love to see something more formal where professionals go in and they and there's more exposure to it early on. Yes. And how can we create this exposure? Like, how, how can you, for example, help in creating this exposure in schools or, I don't know, in general? Yeah, I think it's doing stuff like podcasts, actually, if, or like people like myself trying to serve on local communities mm -hmm. uh, boards. So I do that, too. So one of, I, I serve on the advisory board for the high school here mm -hmm. and for their health and sciences. So I help with like curriculum development and ideas about it. And I was actually in a, a Zoom meeting for a health science class. The teacher brought me in and the kids mm -hmm. just got to ask me questions about being a personal trainer and health and wellness. Yeah. And they had a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. They were so curious about that. So I think more of that, now that we have uh, this video conferencing technology, mm -hmm. you could be anywhere on mm -hmm. the planet and insert yourself into a school wherever it is. But uh, it's really gonna take individual professionals pushing themselves to do it because I don't think the system is really ready for it. So it's kind of like individual people have to push themselves like, hey, let me reach out to this school. Let me help you out. I think I could talk to your class, stuff like that, you know? You are very right, yes. So for people who love to, you know, pursue a career in personal training or mm -hmm. in, in the health and um, fitness sector, what's the best way to go about it? Uh, you know, as much as I kind of said, like the kind of the, the college system and stuff doesn't teach you how to do your job. I still think it's a good way to start because if nothing else, you get the science behind it. You get the, the exercise physiology mm -hmm. behind it. I think for me, besides the compassion, the companionship, probably the, the thing that, that I think makes me a really more proficient trainer is that I know biomechanics. I know physics. Mm -hmm. I know motor learning. And because I know those things, I know how to sequence exercises in a way that creates intensity mm -hmm. for that. I know levers and pulley systems because of that. So I think knowing the actual basics behind how the body works and how the body adapts to a stimulus, yeah. really important as a baseline level. If you don't know that, you're just giving people gimmick exercises, mm -hmm. things that look cool that may not have anything to do with the actual performance that you want them to have yeah. for that. So I think that's, it's important to get more educated trainers within our system. Um, and then after that, I'll spending a lot of time in the psychology of the business. Uh, yeah. So understanding how people behave, how they move, their, the psychosocial dynamics of people in group settings yeah. and one-on-one -on -one settings. And then I think lastly, you have to know about business. I mean, in the end, it is your job, your career. So you'd be surprised. A lot of trainers are horrible with finances. They don't know how to ask for money. Mm -hmm. They don't understand what it's like to create their own business, the LLC status of that, filing taxes, the whole basic stuff of it. I think mm -hmm. being really good at understanding the business of training is really important as well. All of this one can learn um, in college, in, in university, for example. Say that again. I said all of these, one can learn it in the university or in college. Yeah, you can get a lot of, and now I think you can get it outside of school and stuff. There's mm. individual people who are doing stuff, but there's some good books out there. Actually, a colleague of mine uh, wrote a book and gosh, I can't remember what the name of it is, but it was essentially all about like creating a personal training business mm. and the dollars and cents behind it. You know, insurance, being an independent contractor, uh, business owner, I think there's a lot of outlets you can get outside of college for that. And probably the college is probably the worst place to learn about business related to training mm -hmm. because that class is going to occur in, occur basically within uh, probably a kinesiology or a human performance 
environment. And most of the professors who are there have never trained anybody themselves, generally. Uh, maybe that's changed, but I don't think so from what I've, I've been talking to colleagues about. Yeah. You really want to get out there with people who are in the business, who are running their own businesses. They can give you some guidance on what the nuts and bolts of that are. I don't think you're going to get a lot of that in college. Honestly. You're going to get like some basic uh, business courses, but it's not going to be specific to like fitness stuff. Generally. Yeah. So maybe when, maybe when you return back to teaching, for example, in colleges yeah. or university, then the students will be very lucky to have you as a professor so because you, <laughs> you, have, you, have, you have the experience from, you know, the, the business right. part of it already. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big problem in universities, I think, in colleges is that you have a lot of academics teaching mm -hmm. students who are going out into the world. And while they're learning a lot of good science-based things, they really mm -hmm. can't teach you anything about doing your job. That's a real problem. I think you need to hire faculty who are, I'd be a big proponent of hiring college professors, not only teach, but are also still training and coaching people actively while they're teachers, mm -hmm. because then they can give you the hardcore stuff of what's happening during a session because mm -hmm. they're doing sessions all the time. And they can give you the, the knowledge based off of the science mm -hmm. aspect. But mm -hmm. if you, if you just have somebody who's teaching you about hormones and adaptations and you know endocrinology, I mean, that's great. <laughs> but if they can't tell you how to make money in your job yeah. and have a career, who cares? <laughs> like, you know. True, true. Yes, yes, you're right. <laughs> yeah, how to, be, how to make it a performance because training is mm. a performance. Mm. And there's a lot of trainers that just like to work out. And, they, and they're stiff, they're stiff performers. So like, there's not a lot of personality mm. and they're gonna work with people and it's like, man, this is a, like, you need to be loose. You need to enjoy this. This is a performance. This is your magnum opus. Every time you go out there, this is the, the curtains have come open, perform for me, you know, like, and I think you always have to remember it's a performance and somebody paid admission for that performance every time. And they have so to enjoy you have it. To you have to enjoy it. So yeah. it can't just be about well, what are these exercises I'm doing. It needs to be a performance as well. Yeah. Wow, wow. So can you, can you tell me about your podcast, Doctor D's Social Network Podcast, and what are listeners, you know, um, supposed to expect from it when they tune in to, to listen to an episode or, or two? Yeah, um, this podcast is all about not fitness. <laughs> I would say it's like, <laughs> Yeah, I didn't want it to really be about fitness. Initially, mm. I had a lot of fitness people on because I was like, well, I know a lot of fitness people. Mm. But then I was like, you know, I'm interested in so much more than just fitness. So mm. it's essentially a podcast playlist. Let's say it's like a mixtape. Mm. It's of all these different genres of professions and people and different walks of life. So I always tell people, you can never listen to every episode but you could always pick the ones that you like to mm. listen to mm. because you're going to get, you you can learn about everything from quantum mechanics to sexuality, to gender, from fitness, to ophthalmology. I mean, it doesn't matter. You can learn about, you can go through and just pick something that interests you. So for me, it's not necessarily the podcast is about finding a niche and trying to push that niche and grow this sector. It's just like, hey, if you wanna learn, this is a university of ideas, this podcast. Yeah. So if you've always been interested in um, being a lawyer or what it's like, you know, somebody, um, the inside scoop of prison, mm -hmm. death row, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you can go and find those episodes of me chatting with people mm -hmm. from who've been in those environments or yes. who, this, and just go, okay, I learned something today. It's educational, I would say, in that sense. Yeah, that's why it's a, it's a social network podcast. Yes. Like, yes, yes. Yes. A network and, of yes. And everybody that's on my podcast as a guest, they become part of my social network. Mm -hmm. So I actually, every guest that I have, I follow up with them regularly over time just to make sure they're good. I'm building companionship, compassion mm -hmm. with them making sure that they feel that I am connecting with them outside of just the podcast episode. Mm -hmm. I'm nurturing our relationship. So that's once good. you're in the network, you stay in the network. Oh, that's level. good. That's very yeah. good. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so for listeners out there who are very interested in um, 
you know, working with you or connecting with you in one way to get maybe some more advice or to get some tips or maybe also join your online personal training program? Because I, I, that's the beauty of it. It can be anywhere in the world. You could, mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. So what's the best way to, you know, work with you or connect with you? Yeah, so probably the easiest way is through um, my email address, which mm. is uh, darianparker at gmail.com. Mm. Um, other than that, LinkedIn, I'm pretty busy on there. I mm. use that a lot. So you can just find me on there pretty easy. I would say those are those are the main ways, you know, um, you can reach me through my podcast, which is on all major podcasting platforms. Uh, to listen to that, I was but the most simple is email. People will just email me and I get back to them pretty quickly for mm. that. So that's true. Yes. So I'm going to place all of this information in the show notes for this episode, the email address, LinkedIn contact, and also the link to your podcast. So if, I will encourage everyone who is interested to just copy the link or click on the links and get in contact with Dr. Parker for more advice for, you know, great impacts in, in, in health sector or in every area of life. <laughs> Thank awesome. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so, so much for, everything you've been able to teach me today. I really appreciate um, how you've enlightened me on um, fitness and health and wellness. Thank you so much. Thank you, Toby. Appreciate it.